Oh, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for hanging on this Monday. We do appreciate it. Derek Gunn, Barrett Brooks, Rob Ellis. We are Sports Take. Let's hit that like button. We do appreciate it, people. All right, uh, guys, let's uh, let's talk a little bit of, uh, about some, some other things here uh, and the Sixers. Sixers, I'll tell you what. They play the way that they played on Saturday, and I know the level of competition – and the Nets aren't the Celtics or the or the Bucks, but they play the way that they played on Saturday. They got a shot against anybody. Um, so they win the game 121-101. They hit 21 threes. You can't back on that, obviously. Um, but what I liked is they out assisted the Nick, the Nets 32 to 23. They had 89 field goal attempts to 70 for the Nets. They were 21 to 3 on second chance points and 31 to 11. Uh, in terms of scoring off of turnovers, there's a lot of good signs there in those stats. It was it was great from from from, from the beginning to the end. Um, they did exactly what you know. They played the they played the great they played a great game, but it wasn't like it was like a, a, a hard fought game. They just overwhelmed them, and and it's not like the Nets didn't play. Uh, like they they played bad. They actually mm-hmm. played pretty good. Yeah. It's just you could tell they were outclassed, mm-hmm. man to man, team versus team, coach versus coach, against the 76ers. The 76ers just looked like they were just a far greater team than mm-hmm. uh than than they were. So I mean, I was I was I was good, man. I, I was I was like, yo, this is unbelievable, unbelievable. First of all, Brooklyn has nobody to match up with Embiid. They have nobody. They played really good rotating defense. They're very quick uh, around the perimeter. They got some great shooters. They shot almost 56% from the for the game and still lost by 20. Okay? That right. tells you that something is, right there. Yeah, 56% and still lost by 20. Number two, one of the questions, at least for one game, that we went into the series asking, who was going to step up in a pivotal role position? Harris. Tobias yeah. Harris. Plain and simple, Tobias Harris. He stepped up. He put in 21 points, 9 of 14 from the floor. That's a pretty doggone good day, okay? That's all you can ask. That's all you can ask. All we want to know is who's going to step up and be that third person. And the biggest factor I was concerned with as of last week was, would you have to play your two big guns 38 to 43 minutes and B play 33 minutes? He got 15 <laughs> minutes in this game. Perfect. He didn't have to score 40 points. He scored 26 points. He got to sit 15 minutes and rest his body. Okay. James Harden only played 36 minutes with that Achilles. Okay. Uh, perfect numbers for both of them. If they could do that. Now we know it's not going to happen. Every game tells its own story, but yeah. if they can consistently get those kind of numbers, keep, keep him beating at 33, 35 minute range. You're right. They could do a lot of damage in the playoffs. Yeah, if you could have drawn it up, like that's the way you would have drawn up game one. You know, really, oh, they no they question. just everything worked. Um, you know, even even like Maxi didn't have to go crazy in the game, and you were still able to handle them. And Bede had a had a very good, but not he didn't have to go crazy uh, type of game. Harden, I mean, look, he got he got he got blocked a couple times going to the rim, but he clearly had the lift on the step back on the threes. He had the explosion there. He goes 23 and 13. He's seven of 13 from three yep. in the game. And, and really the only, the only really scary threat for Brooklyn is Michael Bridges. And, and yep. yes, he got his, he got 30, but really a lot of that damage was done in the first half. They did an excellent yep. job on him yep. in the second half. I thought so. Absolutely. Th- that, Look, you, you, you can't let up, though, here. You know, you, you can't say, oh, look what happened in game one and come out and not have that eye of the tiger. you got to go out there, you know, and put it on them tonight. That's the big thing. No let up whatsoever. No question. And, and we, talk about, we talk about defensively um, what they were trying to do. That's what we're trying to do to, to, to Embiid, you know, specifically. Every time he touched the ball, they would double team and triple team him. But he would kick it out. And spot up jumpers, man, all day. They were hitting those spot up jumpers, man. Mm-hmm. And that's the biggest thing, you know. They were hitting, uh, you know, just like you said, Tobias Heaven was a lot more aggressive and going out there. And, and when he got kicked to him to be a part of the offense, 
catch it in rhythm, shoot it, boom. You, you know, that was the difference in what I saw before and what I see, you know, during the season than what I see now. He was ready and available to play. Mm-hmm. Ready and available. Yeah. Yeah, no, no question. And, and I think that they – you can see frustration seeping in in a couple different ways. One, Jacques Bond's already going down the Nick Nurse whining routine. I don't know if you guys saw that. He said after the game, hopefully, you know, next game they'll, they'll call some three seconds and some fouls on the big foul. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, that's a sure sign. Like, he looks at it like I'm planting a seed with the officials. To me, that's a cry for desperation. Yep. Like, it is what that is, that he's already pulling that nonsense. Yeah, but you know what? The scary part about it is referees will start looking at this stuff. And you're going to get well, some fan. They're going to get, you're going to get some like, ticky tack calls because it goes both ways. Both teams try to get into a referee's ear and tell, hey, man, you notice him throwing elbows. You notice how he drops his shoulder and you're calling a block on me when it should have been called a charge. Referees start balancing out stuff like that. That's what worries me. Yeah. You know, so if he's already crying about this after game one, the refs are going to start looking at that a little bit more closely. Is there some validity to it? Eh, you know what sounds like game one sour grapes to me, but it's in the refs' minds now. Absolutely. And I've seen this happen too many times where, you know, a player plays his game a certain way, all of a sudden he's handcuffed because the refs start listening to the whining from the other side. Yeah. Hey, it, it, let me throw this at you guys. Uh, we'll, we'll get it back to, to the Sixers in a second. But uh, Bryce Young has canceled his remaining pre-draft visits, according to Tom Pelissaro of the NFL Network. In the tweet he puts out, he says, another sign to back up the belief within the league that the 2021 Heisman Trophy winner will be the Panthers' number one overall pick. Mm. Uh, he's also visited the Texans at number two. But there's a there's a growing belief among league circles that this is a done deal and Bryce Young's going one. You guys That's buying it? Looks, huh? I will say Chris Mortensen from ESPN was on this a long time ago. I will say that uh, from what he was hearing. I- I'm sorry, but – what what are they saying? I, I I love his game. He's a winner, but the dude is 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 soaking wet. Is lucky if he's 180 pounds soaking wet. I don't yeah. get it. You know, we we look at quarterbacks that are being drafted in today's game. They're all six three, six four, two twenty five, two thirty five. You look at this dude's physical dynamics, and it's it's everything screaming. You want well, take somebody who could be considered a fragile franchise player at that body weight and type. What what are they looking? What are the experts looking at? Where he elevated over C.J. Stroud? I don't get it. C.J. Stroud is a prototypical body type, and supposedly attributes according to the experts that every court every team wants for a franchise quarterback. But now we're starting to hear more and more about this Bryce Young leapfrogging past C.J. to be the number one overall pick. I, that I don't is know. Crazy, isn't it? And I, I Frank Wright's on board with this. Frank I, Wright's a quarterback guru. Right. I guess you're you're throwing caution to the wind with his size, and you just believe so much in what kind of football player is. Like what I would worry about more than anything else is those kind of hits where that where the defensive player lands on him, and how does he hold up between the three hundred pounder and the ground with that with no give? You know how does he physically hold up? You, Bro, that's what. Jalen yeah. Hurts six two, squats six hundred pounds. We saw what happened in the um, Chicago game, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, we saw what happened. So to think that to think that he's not going to get hurt, everybody gets hurt in the league. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? You just can't you just can't play with that type of fear. I mean, look at you know look at Drew Brees for years. You know what I'm saying? Played that way. You know uh, um, who else was a smaller quarter? See, it's not a lot of them. You know what I'm saying? But there are Drew guys Brees. Yeah. Drew Brees was smaller. Drew Brees is smaller. He weighed more uh, than than Bryce Young, but he was smaller. For yeah. Sure. Um, who else? Tua's Tua is not the biggest guy in the world, and and yeah. then look, Tua's oh, yeah. stuff has oh, yeah. been head. Flukey yeah. was the name. Flu- Flutie. Flutie. Doug Flutie. Darren Flutie. Flutie. Yeah. I mean, Doug, Doug Flutie. Doug. Yeah. Okay, but so, look what yeah, happened to Tua last year. Tua got slung down to the ground, hit his head. He's out. Yep. Now <laughs> Tua's not the biggest quarterback out there. This dude's lighter than Tua. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Wait, wait till the defensive lineman grabs him by an arm or a shoulder and throws him to the ground. He goes head first. Yeah. You think he's gonna get up without feeling like he's on rubber leg street? Yeah. Um somebody said Alex Smith in the chat. Alex Smith was six four. Alex yeah. Smith was anything but Russell two-four. Wilson's five ten, five eleven, but Russell Wilson is stocky stockily he's built. Stout. Yeah, the, the difference is with Bryce, he's he's on the thinner side and he's short. he's two hundred pounds though now. He's they say okay. he finally reached 200 pounds. Okay. So who, who, who 5, 10, 200 pounds. Yeah. Who? 
Bryce is. 5'10", 200. Okay. All right. I mean, look, uh, I, I – <laughs> Sounds like you're not buying. Numbers it. How many numbers are doctored? I mean, come on, man. But but the thing is, I, I the flip side of it is, the dude won a ton at Alabama. Make can make every throw, even despite maybe not being able to see over the line of scrimmage. He's clutch. He's great in uh, uh, off schedule plays. If you want, to me, he's the best off schedule thrower in the in the draft, like bar none. Any everything breaks down, the dude doesn't panic, keeps his eyes down yes. the field, and still delivers. So there, there's a lot. There's a lot of good there, you know, you know, for sure. But I would be worried about his size. I mean, it's legit, but Barrett, they, Barrett. Mu- they must many, just how many, be blown away. How many dudes are listed as 6'4", 270 coming out of college? They get to the combine. They're 6'2 and a half, 255. I mean, <laughs> I mean, come on. These are it's kind of the same thing with Brandon Graham. Brandon Graham was the same way. Yes. You know, they they yes. listed him bigger. Mamula was the same way. Uh, first guy, first came out of college, I was 6'4". Uh, I was six, four. Um, I was six four, two hundred I me mean, three hundred and three hundred two pounds, but on my on my uh, scouting report and everything, I was six five, three hundred fifteen. <laughs> and it, they actually did a story on me. Uh, I was one of twenty guys entering the draft that year that were over three hundred pounds. You know, they had, they said there was only like a hundred guys in the NFL that were three hundred pounds or more, and we were it was twenty of us coming in that year in the league. Mm. So, you know, but now look at it. You know, I remember I played with this dude named Aaron Gibson. Aaron Gibson, oh. you can look him up right now. Big Gibby yes. played at Wisconsin. Yep. They gave me – his head was so big they had to make a helmet for him, customized helmet for him. He was 410 pounds, six foot eight, but had washboard abs. Yeah, that's crazy. Abs, bro. Could do the splits. One of the best athletes I've ever seen in my life playing tackle, <laughs> offensive tackle, Big Gibby. Yeah, that's true. I was also listed at six five coming out of high school, but you know, <laughs> there were some questionable measurements there. Uh, you know, we'll Cheerio, see. Dry Cheerio shrunk that's right. his height. They, they did. They stunted it. They stunted it like smoking. So um, if, you'd a, if you'd ate white castles, that's true. <laughs> Blown up like a puffer fish. Yeah. So the Sixers play tonight uh, against the the uh, the Nets. It'll be game two tonight at Wells Fargo Center. Uh, they could look to take a two zero lead in that. We'll get into a whole NBA segment in the last segment, by the way, just because there's a lot happening: upsets, injuries, just a lot going on. Um, all right, from a Philly st- standpoint, guys. So they win fourteen to three yesterday. They they rip off a nine spot in the first inning. They end up with 23 total hits. Every starter had an RBI and a hit. Eight starters had multiple hits in the game. Bryson Stott, first career leadoff home run. He tied Puddinghead Jones, Derek's favorite, Puddinghead <laughs> Jones, for the most consecutive hits to start a season at 16. Um, here's the goofy thing with the Phillies, okay? Wouldn't first of all, they've been highly frustrating all year. But So Monday, they get 15 runs against Sandy Alcantara, okay? Fast forward to yesterday, you know, they, they roll the Reds 14 to three. So they had 15 and 14. But here's the problem the five games in between this week, they scored 16 runs. Mm-hmm. So a little more than three runs per game. They, they have been feast or famine in a lot of ways. You know, yesterday they had five hits with runners in scoring position just in the first inning. They had 11, they were 11 for 27 the whole game. So they got 27 men and runners with scoring position. They've been getting hits all year. They just haven't been clutched. There's been two two issues with the Phillies. One, starting pitching has not been good enough. Two, they have not been clutched. The clutch part's going to come. They're getting too many hits not to start scoring runs. They got to get better pitching. They have to. Um, that's the issue. Know. I think that's the biggest issue we have. I mean, hits will come. They'll start playing running bases better. But starting pitching has to be last has to last with quality more than four or five innings, man. We just yeah. your, re- your relievers are getting way too many innings right now. Yep, yeah. they're getting killed. Way too many innings. And and uh, Nola had his best outing of the season. Of course, when you walk out on the hill before you even f- throw your first pitch and you got a nine spot in front of you, you can relax a whole lot easier than when the game is 0-0. But he, he, pitched, he pitched well. Um, but even Strong got lit up. The one guy that we've been praising, he got lit up. Yeah, it's like you don't know what's going to happen day to day with this team. There's no measure of consistency, and now you're going to face a White Sox team that's six and ten. But if you look at their offensive numbers, they're one of the better teams in the American League right now in terms of offensive numbers. 
Mm-hmm. Their biggest problem is their pitching staff has given up a, an average of almost six runs a game. So mm-hmm. we could be looking at a lot of slugfests that can go either way in this series coming up starting tonight. Yeah. Well, yeah. they split uh, this series two to two, right? They did. But, it, you know, Cincinnati's a bad team. Like, you shouldn't be. Yes. We're well, going into be... another bad team now. So they should, you saying, I mean, 2-1? Two, one, we should yeah, they be... should take two out of three. Yeah, so tonight's game's been postponed. Chicago weather's nasty. Mm-hmm. They're going to play a, a traditional doubleheader tomorrow, 4-10 start, and then a 7-10 start. Uh, tomorrow game one will be wheeler game two will be falter that's the way they're going to do it but it's like 30 degrees in chicago windy nasty not exactly baseball weather be thankful where we're at man 60 some outside right now even though the temperature dropped from 80s to 60 something i'm like hey the sun's shining the ground is dry i'm loving it i hear you i hear you with that um yeah so they end up turner by the way trey turner gets uh on base all five plate appearances three hits two walks i i'm gonna rip trey turner here for a minute um oh yeah i i did not like what i saw on on saturday so there's a play where he hits a ground ball there's a runner on first there's a, there's two outs he hits a ground ball um and the the throw to uh actually was it yeah the throw to first base is errant first of all he didn't run coming out of the box he dogged it out of the box then the throw gets beyond the first baseman and he assumes that it just goes real far and kicks far away and he can stroll to second base. He starts strolling and then he realizes you know, the first the ball kicked back to the first base and pretty quick. He gets thrown out at second base. It was two plays in which he did not hustle. Okay. And, you know, this has been a problem for the Spillies team all year, whether it's not hustling or just stupid base running or whatever the case may be. It was emblematic of a lot of the problems that have been going on. Now, to his credit, he had two infield hits to start the game. He had actually two infield hits in the first inning yesterday. He busted his his ass on both of those. But like, I hope it was a wake up call to all of them because that stuff's unacceptable. It's happening way too much with this team. So they got to start hustling. There are some good signs. Stott's one of them. Marsh was four for six yesterday with two doubles, uh, with a double, three singles, and an RBI. Bohm was three for six. Bohm's got a ten game hit streak. Yep. You, yep. You know, th- this is also where it's it's strange with this team. Like if you look at at the numbers of some of these guys in the starting lineup, like you'd say this team's got to be off to an unbelievable start. Bryson Stott's hitting 380. Trey Turner's hitting 338. Mm-hmm. Castellanos, not bad, 279. Uh 350 for Bohm. Marsh, 378. Like like these averages and and actually Schwarber's starting to hit for average now. He's, he was at like 150. He's at 230. The, they're going to start scoring well, runs. He might get to yep. 250. He might get to 250 before it's over. Yeah, but they're, they're starting to hit. It, it's just a matter of they got to get it all together. It's been so choppy. And if, you look, if, you look at, if you look at positions five, six, and seven in the order yesterday, they went 13 for 18, Whoa. scored six runs, and, and drove in three RBI as well. So they were very productive. Matter of fact, they were more productive five, six, and seven than one, two, and three. Mm-hmm. If you really want to stack the numbers together, um, you get the but you get the bottom of the, that. That's why I said this, the, we can complain about Harper and Hoskins not being there now. Potentially, you have sixty home runs between those two out of the lineup, mm-hmm. but you still have you have so much firepower. When your five, six, and seven hitters can collect thirteen hits and eighteen plate appearances, and that's not an exception. This particular lineup has the talent to do that consistently. But the problem has been they have not done anything consistently up to this point. Everything mm-hmm. they've done, getting caught on bases, you know, thrown out on the base pass, not moving runners in scoring position. What were they yesterday? Probably their best game. Yeah. yeah, best game in terms of running, pushing runners in scoring position. You have to have that more consistently. You do. Mm-hmm. You know, with the, a lot of good teams are real heavy. On the front end of your order, one through four, one through five, and the back end, you just hope and hit. They, you just hope they can hit and contribute. This team has the capability of being consistently good in the bottom of the order every night. Got to put it together. Yeah, and I, and I know it's April, but we can't use that as an excuse anymore. Yeah, the the, the it's you know, I, I'm with you, Derek. I'm tired of the it's early thing. I mean, exactly. It's you done. Know, you got to start we'll sneak up on us. Well, the other thing is like, you know, yeah, you were able to do it last year, but you can't count on that, that you're going to go on some kind of really insane run like that. Start playing more consistent baseball, especially now. They don't play another team with a winning record for the rest of the month of April. 
So they, they got to get their act together. Uh, that's for sure. So anyway, if, if you're just tuning in, uh, the, the big story of the day is Jalen Hurts and the extension that he got from the Eagles. It's five years. It's $255 million, which runs through 2028. There's a no trade clause. That's the first time the Eagles organization has ever given out a no trade clause. Um, he will get 179 million guaranteed, 110 full fully guaranteed at signing, uh, 23 million dollar uh, signing bonuses. He will make 64 next year, uh, 126.5 million uh, basically in about 11 months. Let's start with the no trade clause. Barrett, for you as a player, what does that mean for you that you hear that they give out a no trade clause to somebody? It, it gives the player the ability to to really uh, be the captain of his fate. Um, there are times where you think you're making what you're supposed to be making. A team may think you're making too much. And they try to trade you, and they try to trade you to a team that virtually needs you. But usually when you go into a team that needs you like that, it's a team that's, you know, bad. You know, the no, cla- no trade clause keeps them from doing that right. because this, historically you go to bad teams. The bad team is trying to get good. A team like the Eagles is not going to trade to a good team because it might be better and, you know, right. hurt them in the long run. Mm-hmm. So that no trade clause keeps you keeps you in a power position as far as negotiation or if there's a time in which you have to, you know, when, when they're thinking about trading you or trying to, you know, cook their books a little bit and, and, and get down on the salary cap. It helps you out, keeps mm-hmm. gives you a little more power than the team. Yeah, and it doesn't, Derek. It doesn't mean they can't. You hope it doesn't get to this, but they they could cut him. They yeah. could still cut him. It, exactly. it doesn't mean sure, that sure. he's going to get paid, but you can cut him. I mean, it's just the way the league works. Um, you're not you're not on the hook to keep him on your team. But I, I think it's just a nice little incentive to 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 give to to Jalen and to tell him, hey man, like we believe in you here, and he'll make less over the. You know, it's just from a, from a cap standpoint, he'll make less. I'm excluding these these guarantees with the bonuses and the signing and whatnot. But then Daniel Jones, like he will make less than Daniel Jones over the next two years. So and I mean, rightfully so. Yeah, and how he you know worked this where he still gave himself a chance to to have some wiggle room here. Absolutely, and that's huge right there because Jalen Hurts in his camp gave him that wiggle room. He understands you got a you got a window to, that right now when they are a really good team in this window. Regardless of what happens in the draft, this team is good enough to win next year with the team that they have in that locker room right now. There's not a lot of times that can say that. There's not a lot of teams at all that can say that. A lot of the time it's like you're 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 in a position where all right, it's the draft is going to dictate whether you're going to be good or not. Well, this team is already good right now with the players they have. In that locker room, on defensive side of the ball, also, I'm, I'm the only positions that you know I'm really worried about and concerned about is punting <laughs> and returning. I, I'm concerned. I am concerned about those two for sure. I, I'm concerned. I'm still concerned about linebacker. I'm still concerned uh, about safety. I am. I, I mean, all those all those areas still concern me. I think there's, there's reason for it. Look, we don't know. We don't know about Nicobe Dean. We don't know the, 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 how that Terrell Edmonds and, you know, the, the safety spot is going to shake itself out. You know, it, it feels like there was a, I don't know, a loss of talent. And we just, then we're not sure at this point, you know, with those. What I'm, what I'm concerned about is the longer they don't win another trophy, the more you allow other teams to catch up to you. Right. What we saw in the NFC in 2022, I had never seen before in terms of the disparity in the talent levels from one team to all the other teams. Every other team in that conference except the Eagles had question marks across the board at strategic positions. I had never seen that in the NFC before. And the Eagles capitalized on it, fell short of their destination. Now they're in a prime position to be there again. You look at the NFC teams across the board. Even the teams that are considered a threat to the Eagles, they have question marks. You know, um, what is Dallas going to be now that Zeke is gone? What are they going to do to get that dual running back threat again? Dak, Dak bounced back. Dak usually up until last year protected the ball well. We talked about how he was really good at protecting the football. Um it wasn't the same deck in 2022. Washington, big quarterback questions. 
What is D Brian Dable surrounding Daniel Jones with up in New York? Carolina, quarterback issues. Tampa Bay, Baker Mayfield, are you kidding me? Green Bay's going to a young, untested quarterback. Minnesota looks better on paper with a, Brian Flores as defensive coordinator. You still got Kirk Cousins as your quarterback. So on and so forth. How much better will Justin Fields get? Don't know. Bears have done a great job surrounding him with talent on defense, got him a receiver. But will that equate to him playing that much better? We know he can run the football. Now we need to see him throw the football a lot better. The Rams, the hot mess. How much is Seattle going to be better? You know, what's the 49ers situation until the quarterbacks get healthy? Right. They got the defense. They got everything they need except the quarterback. Mm -hmm. So many question marks across the board about the NFC um, for two years in a row now. Never seen this before. And now the Eagles in a position, they got a quarterback, they got the pass catchers, running game, best offensive line in the conference, defensive personnel, they got to fix the wide uh, linebacker position, question mark, one safety in the back end, but they have more pieces right now than anybody else in the conference. Still well, working with pieces. pieces. Yep. Look, I'm used, to, I'm used to going in with the linebackers in the safety position we have right now. So I know you guys are worried about it, but this has kind of been status quo of what we've been having over. The, we're, it, 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 I think you two are starting to get greedy with 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 this linebacker deal, man. You guys are starting to think, all right, you, you act like you don't know what they do as far as the linebacker position. They just don't pay the linebacker position. No, nope. you know what I'm saying they just don't do it. You know, so that's why they're going. So I'm confident in Dean being the guy to go in and and play consistently over the over the, the 2023 season. I'm confident. Mm -hmm. I'm confident Morrow will come in and play probably at the same level as a, as a white that just left. Yeah. So I'm confident in that. I have more confident in Morrow right now than I would say because he has experience than Dean until Dean gets that experience. Okay. So that's kind of status quo. What I'm looking at with that, with that. at the safety position, I mean, we got a veteran guy there right now, a veteran guy to play safety to me, to me, we're winning. You know what I'm saying? We're winning because of that. You know, I, 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 all right, I understand that, you know, everywhere else, you know, I mean, Reed Blankenship's going to be a starter. Um, Justin yeah, but Evans, I, 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 real quick with Ed, Edmonds, I, he's he's a, he's solid. I, he's not special. Well, that's what I'm saying. You guys are spoiled. Now y'all want special people. Well, I mean, uh, look. <laughs> the guy that, that's him talking. That's not the, me. The guy that walked – had what six interceptions? You know, I yeah, but those get bad quarterbacks, and also I hear you. And yeah. he, he didn't bring time. he didn't bring stuff to the game that you know the casual fan couldn't see. Yeah, a lot of the times I saw CJ DJ being out of position, even on those passing plays. I know two picks, um, two of those picks. The reason why he got those picks because the quarterback threw to where the ball's supposed to go, the wrong spot. Of the ball, yeah, where the ball wasn't supposed to go. And he was in the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to be somewhere else, but he stayed there, not because he read it, because he just didn't know where to be in the defense. You know what All I'm right. saying? I got so, you. So, you know, it's, it's it's kind of – you'll see a far different guy at CJ GJ than you saw when you had him here. You'll see a far different guy. Okay. You won't see uh, the same guy. You're going to see what CJ GJ really is. All right. All right. A tweet from Buda Baker regarding Jalen Hurts. Hard work always prevails. Congrats to Jay Hertz. Best thing about a guy like him is the work never stops. Ah so, da da. Buddha's, Buddha's already, time together. He's Let's already time together. He's already trying. <laughs> he's already trying. Yes. Yes. It's tied together. <laughs> you gotta love it. You gotta love uh social media and the way these guys work it now. All right, let's uh let's get a timeout and we will come back. We'll continue with the NFL talk. We'll speaking of Buddha Baker, we'll discuss him. We'll talk about the uh, Dolphins making a move. We'll get into offensive line, in particular offensive tackle prospects, and certainly more, more, more when it comes to Jalen Hurts. We will do all of that when we come back. Don't go anywhere. Barrett, Derek, Rob, Sports Take, Jacob Sports YouTube Network on this crazy Monday. Yes, Flynn Tree Services. They're an experienced, licensed, and insured Pennsylvania tree services company that will trim or remove any unwanted trees off of your property. They are experts trimming all types of trees, and they serve southeastern Pennsylvania, South Jersey, and northern Delaware. Flynn Tree Services specializes in tree removal, stump grinding, as well as tree pruning. You go to their Facebook or Instagram page for more information or a sampling of their work. Give Flynn Tree Services a call at 610-850-2850. 